Claudette Colvin is a pioneer of the 1950 civil rights movement. March 2nd, 1955, she was arrested at the age of 15 in Montgomery, Alabama for refusing to give up her seat to a white woman on a crowded Montgomery bus. If you like stories like this, you can find more stories like this at OneMikeHistory.com. Also, if you'd like to support the channel, you can do so on my Patreon page or my Buy Me Coffee in the description below. Also, give us five stars on Apple Podcasts and support the YouTube channel. But without further ado, let's get started. This holiday, instead of giving them something nice, why not gift them somewhere nice? During the IHG Hotels and Resorts Cyber Sale, you can do just that and save. Shopping is easy in the IHG One Rewards app, where you'll save 20% on travel across 6,000 plus global destinations. And if you want to gift yourself somewhere nice, go ahead. You'll earn more and save more during the Cyber Sale. Check out all the deals at IHG.com backslash Cyber Sale. Terms apply. Born Claudette Austin in Montgomery, Alabama in September 5th, 1949 to Marie Jane Glasson and J.P. Austin. Her father left when she was really young and Claudette's mother moved in with her great aunt and uncle Mary Ann and Q.P. Colvin in Pine Level, Alabama. Claudette and her sister referred to the Colvins as their parents and even took their last name. When Claudette turned eight, Marianne Colvin inherited a house in Montgomery, Alabama, so her family could be in the city. Montgomery was a completely different city from Pine Level, but which was very rural, and she loved going to downtown Montgomery, but it also made her very angry because she could shop at the white stores and they would take her money, but she could try on anything. By 1955, Claudette was a student at the segregated Booker T. Washington High School in the city. She rode a city bus to get to and from school, and during that time, 70% of the customers on the bus line were African Americans, but they were discriminated against by the custom of sitting in segregated seating. See, Jim Crow not only separated the races, but controlled every aspect of African Americans' lives, and nothing was more humiliating than riding the bus. All the passengers had to enter in the front, but Unless the entire white section was empty, black passengers had to get off and re-enter in the rear of the bus. If the bus became so crowded that all the white seats in the front of the bus were filled and white passengers were left standing, any African American was supposed to give up their seat and move further to the back or stand in the aisle or leave the bus completely. So on March 2nd, 1955, Claudette was let out early from school because of a faculty meeting and she was returning home. She boarded the bus, she paid her fare, walked straight on to the bus because there were no white people on the bus at that time and sat in the first colored section seat, two seats away from the emergency exit. As they rolled, the bus got more and more crowded as white folks got off of work. So when a white woman got on the bus, was left standing in the aisle between the seats on Claudette's row, clearly expecting her to get up, the bus driver, Robert W. Cleary, looked in the mirror and said, I need those seats. And the three black women in her row moved to the back. As the other three moved, the white woman was still sitting there across from Claudette looking for her to move. So the driver said, why are you still sitting there? To which another black passenger responded, she ain't got to do nothing but be black and die. The driver continued on, but during the idle moments, Ruth Hamilton, who was a pregnant woman, got on the bus and sat right next to Claudette. So the driver hollered for a policeman and two police officers got on the bus. They soon convinced a black man to give up his seat for Miss Hamilton so she could move into that seat. But Claudette still refused to move and she was forcibly dragged off the bus and arrested. During the ride to the station, they swore at her and made sexual comments about her body. They took turns attempting to guess her bra size and called her a nigger bitch. One of the officers even sat in the back seat with her and this made her fear that she would be sexually assaulted because that sort of thing happened often at the time. Claudette was initially charged with disturbing the peace, violating segregation laws, and assault and battery on a police officer. A group of local civil rights activist leaders came together to discuss Claudette Coven's arrest with the police commissioner and she was bailed out of jail by her local minister, who then told her that she had brought a revolution to Montgomery. This event took place almost nine months before NAACP Secretary Rosa Parks was arrested for the exact same offense, and Claudette would later state that her mother told her to keep quiet about what she did. She told me to let Rosa be the one. White people were not going to bother her. They like her, and she felt that she didn't receive the same attention as Rosa Parks for a number of reasons. One, she didn't have good hair, she wasn't fair-skinned, and she was a teenager and pregnant. At that time, civil rights leaders wanted to keep up appearances, and they wanted to make sure that the most appealing protesters were out front. 
Despite this, she was represented by Frederick Gray from the Montgomery Approving Association, which organized civil rights action in Montgomery. Colvin was convicted on three charges in juvenile court. When her case was appealed to the Montgomery Circuit Court in May 6, 1955, the charges of disturbing the peace and violating the segregation laws were dropped. After the start of Montgomery bus boycott in December of 1955, black community leaders began discussing a federal lawsuit to challenge the city of Montgomery and Alabama segregation laws. They felt that Alabama statutes and ordinance in the city of Montgomery provided for the enforcement of racial segregation on privately operated buses violated the 14th Amendment Equal Protection Clause. So about two months after the bus boycott, civil rights activists started to reconsider the case of Claudette Colvin. Freddie Gray, Edie Nixon, and Clifford Dunn had been searching for the ideal case to challenge the constitutionality of Montgomery, Alabama segregation laws, and Dern had concerns about Rosa Parks' case will be tied up in the Alabama court system for years and as useful as Rosa Parks' case was in providing them for a valid reason for an uprising in the civil rights movement, it was decided it would not make an ideal case because of the criminal statutes in her case. Freddie Gray wanted the court to only have to decide about the constitutionality of the laws around segregation on buses. Freddie Gray consulted multiple lawyers from the NAACP's Legal Defense Fund, and he approached Colvin, Aria Brower, Susie McDonald, Mary Louise Smith, and Janae Reese all the women who have been discriminated against by the enforcement of the segregation policies on the Montgomery bus system, and all of them have become plaintiffs in a federal civil lawsuit that would bypass Alabama's court system. Janae Reese would ultimately drop out of the case in February 1956 because of intimidation from local white folks, and she would falsely claim that she had not agreed to the lawsuit, which would lead to an unsuccessful attempt to disbar Freddie Gray for supposedly improperly representing her. February 1st, 1956, Freddie Gray filed the Aria Brower Gale in the United States District Court. Aria Brower was a Montgomery woman who had been discriminated against on segregated buses, and A.W. Gale was the mayor of Montgomery. The following month, Martin Luther King and 90 of his followers were arrested for conspiring to conduct a boycott, and this led to the ensuing trial to be publicized and help bring light to Dr. King's crusade for civil rights and attention to the Brower Gale case general. Because Brower Gale challenged the constitutionality of a state statute, the case was brought before a three-judge district court panel. On May 11, 1956, the first day of the trial, Freddie Gray had meticulously planned the order of his first witnesses. He wanted to start fast with Aria Brower, who was a 37-year-old, well-spoken black woman, and finished strong with Claudette Colvin. Walter Canabe represented the city of Montgomery, and his strategy was two-part. First, to state that the black community did not object to segregation before the boycott, reminding them that initially they had only pushed for black drivers better treatment, not the end of segregation. And two, Dr. King was the one who stirred up all the trouble, and the city tried to paint him as a silver-tongued outsider who never rode the buses in Montgomery. But during Claudette Colvin's testimony, Walter Kanabe got right to the heart of the issue and asked her why she stopped riding the buses on December 5th. And she answered, because we were being treated dirty and nasty. Much later, Charles Langford, one of the lawyers for the plaintiff, stated that if there was a star witness in the boycott case, it was Claudette Colvin. On June 5th, 1956, the panel voted two to one that segregation on Alabama's interstate buses was unconstitutional, citing Brown versus the Board of Education as a precedent for the verdict. They stated that bus segregation laws in the city of Montgomery denied and deprived plaintiffs and other Negro citizens similarly situated in equal protection of the laws and due process on the laws secured by the 14th Amendment. Judge Franklin M. Johnson would later state that the testimony of Ms. Colvin and the others reinforced the constitutional position that you can't abridge the freedoms of individuals. The Boycott case was a simple case of legal and human rights being denied. December 17, 1956, the Supreme Court rejected the city and state appeals to reconsider their decision. Three days later, the order to integrate the buses had arrived in Montgomery. December 20th, King and the Montgomery Improvement Association voted to end the 381-day bus boycott. And in a statement, King stated that the Euro protest against the city buses is officially called off and Negro citizens in Montgomery are urged to return to the buses tomorrow morning in a non-segregated basis. The city buses were integrated the following day. In the aftermath, 
Claudette Colvin gave birth to a son, Raymond, in March 1956. She received her GED in 1957 and left Montgomery to move to New York in 1958 because she was unable to find work following her participation in a federal court case. Colvin stated that she had been branded a troublemaker by many in the community and similarly, Rosa Parks also left Montgomery for Detroit because of her role in the Montgomery bus boycott. Claudette Colvin would receive training as a nurse and worked as a nurse's aide for a nursing home in Manhattan during the late 60s. She was continued working there for 35 years before retiring in 2004. As time passed, she was seemingly forgotten from history because she really told her story after moving to New York. She came to terms with her raw feelings about her contribution to the civil rights movement being overshadowed by other actors. But in 1975, Frank Storka, a reporter for the Birmingham newspaper, wrote a story about the Montgomery bus boycott and found information on Claudette Colvin. He then followed up by contacting her and writing a story about her experiences. After that, it was followed by more stories and more articles, and slowly her name began to appear in the history of the Montgomery bus boycott and the movement in general. Now, she says she looks forward to inspiring and ensuring a new generation of African Americans. In November of 2021, Colvin, now 82 years old, applied to have her juvenile record expunged in a Montgomery County court. Having been in place on indefinite probation after her conviction in 1955, December, the Montgomery Juvenile Court Judge Calvin Williams ordered that her juvenile record be expunged and destroyed, stating that Colette Colvin's refusal to leave her seat has been recognized as a courageous act on her behalf and behalf of the community of affected people. Thank you. I'm your host, Country Boy. This has been the life of Claudette Colvin. And if you like more stories like this, you can find more stories like this at OneMikeHistory.com. Also, if you'd like to support the channel, you can do so at my Patreon page or my Buy Me Coffee in the description below. Give us five stars on Apple Podcasts and support the YouTube channel. Peace.